The fact that Saul is involved in this relief will help his standing with the Jerusalem saints. This will help prepare the Jerusalem saints to believe that God has started a new dispensation, and it will help them take Saul's side in the dispute that occurs in Acts 15. 12 God delivers Peter from prison, symbolizing God's deliverance of the little flock at the end of the tribulation period. God kills Herod, symbolizing God's destruction of the Antichrist. The Word of God grows in Jerusalem, symbolizing many people in Israel being saved and entering God's kingdom at the end of the tribulation period. 12 colon 1-3 The great persecution that comes upon Israel is a sign of the prophecy dispensation being put on hold. Israel's program being set aside means that God allows Satan to persecute the church as a way of chastening Jews so that they may believe the gospel of grace. Therefore, we saw a great persecution in 8 colon 1, and we see another one here. Apostate Israel is also seen, here, as still hating the little flock, such that the Jewish religious leaders are happy to see one of the twelve apostles James being killed. As such, Herod is a type of the Antichrist. Note the parenthetical note at the end of 12 colon 3 that Herod apprehended Peter just before the days of unleavened bread. This was a feast, immediately after the Passover, to celebrate being led out of Egypt, which, in its full meaning, is a celebration of being led out of bondage to sin and Satan, Exodus 12 verse 17. However, due to their unbelief, Israel is still in bondage to sin and Satan, even though Jesus was the complete Passover lamb sacrifice to get them out of this bondage. The first killing of one of the twelve apostles and the imprisonment of Peter show that Israel is still in spiritual bondage. Twelve colon four four quaternions of soldiers would be a total of sixteen soldiers. This detail is told to us so that we know that Peter was well guarded. This verse is the only mention of Easter in the Bible. It was not a celebration of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Rather, it is the pagan celebration, in which they celebrate the resurrection of the god, Tammuz, who was brought back to life by his mother, Ishtar, pronounced Easter. The tradition of colored eggs also comes from this pagan celebration, since Tammuz was born by being hatched from an egg. The feast God established was Passover, which took place just before the days of unleavened bread, Leviticus 23 verses 5 to 6. Thus, the little flock had already celebrated Passover. At that time, Easter was celebrated by the pagans at the time of the vernal equinox, which was around March 21st, which would have been after Passover. Herod was a Gentile king, and he intended to keep Peter in prison until after his pagan holiday of Easter was over. Thus, it is Herod who celebrated Easter. It was not believers who celebrated that holiday. The Jewish believers celebrated Passover and unleavened bread, not the pagan holiday of Easter. 12 colon 5 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 commands us today, in the dispensation of grace, to pray without ceasing. This does not mean you have your eyes closed and pray to God all the time. Rather, it means that you should always be thinking over sound doctrine as you make decisions in life. Here, we see an example of prayer without ceasing. There is no mention of an around-the-clock prayer chain going on. They could get a good night's sleep and still pray without ceasing for Peter, because that just means that they were constantly thinking about Peter's well-being. 12 colon 6 7 Jesus told Peter that he would be carried away to be killed, but that would not happen until he is old. John 21 verses 18 to 19. God still has work for Peter to do. Therefore, he sends the angel of the Lord to deliver him. Peter's deliverance from prison also symbolizes God's deliverance of the little flock from apostate Israel and the Antichrist at the end of the tribulation period. 12 colon 8 The angel of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ, since he speaks as God, e.g., Exodus 3 verses 2 to 6.
Acts 12 is the last mention of the angel of the Lord in scripture, which is another indication that the prophecy dispensation has been put on hold, since God operates in the spiritual, rather than in the physical realm, in the mystery dispensation. There may be some irony, here, because the angel of the Lord, who is Jesus, tells Peter to follow me, 12 colon 8, just like he told him at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, Matthew 4 verse 19. This is probably an indication that Peter has a new calling from the Lord, which is to edify members of the little flock, as opposed to preaching the kingdom gospel to the lost sheep of Israel. Peter recognizes this new calling in Acts 15, according to Paul's account in Galatians 2 verses 7 to 9. So, Jesus calls Peter, here, to go only to the little flock with kingdom doctrine, while, in the next chapter, the Holy Ghost calls Paul to begin dispensing the mystery gospel, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, to all unbelievers, 13, colon 2. 1210 passing the first and the second ward before the angel departed from him may be a sign of how the Lord Jesus Christ will be with Peter throughout the time between Jesus' first and second comings, Matthew 28 verse 20. The opening of the gate that leads to the city is probably a sign of how the Lord Jesus Christ will enter through the gate and dwell with saved Israel in the New Jerusalem, Ezekiel 43 verses 1 to 7. 12.15-16 Although the little flock prayed for Peter's release from prison, they did not have faith that God would miraculously deliver him from prison, because they were astonished when they actually saw him. This shows that having faith in God to do a miracle had nothing to do with God doing the miracle. God's will is the determining factor. Today, God has ceased doing physical miracles, because the word of God is complete, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8-10. Therefore, God's will today is always not to do the physical miracle. At the time of Acts 12, though, physical miracles still occurred since the word of God was not complete yet. Note the influence of religion within the little flock. Their response to Rhoda was that it was Peter's angel that she saw. Many people today believe that there are guardian angels, but there is no evidence of this in scripture. Apparently, the belief in guardian angels goes back at least 2,000 years. The scripture, the scripture used for this today is Matthew 18 verse 10, which says, in reference to immature believers, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. The reason given for this is for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost, Matthew 18 verse 11. In other words, the job of these angels is to make sure the lost sheep of Israel are found and enter God's kingdom. This does not mean that there are angels to protect people physically. Besides, how could these angels protect people physically when they are always looking at the Father, rather than looking at the actual people? 1217 The James, here, is James the brother of Jesus, since James the Apostle had already been killed, 12.2. Now that the kingdom dispensation is over, in which Jesus had appointed Peter the leader, Matthew 16 verses 18 to 19, we will see James take a bigger role, speaking up at the Jerusalem Council, 15, 13-21, since Peter no longer holds the kingdom keys since the kingdom has been set aside and the gospel of grace is going out. Peter probably stepped down as the leader in 932. 1220 Now, we skip to a different story involving Herod. This story is told so that we know that the threat that Herod had been to the little flock has been eliminated since God killed him. 12 22 23 Herod is a type of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will sit on the throne and declare himself to be God. Herod sat on a throne, and others declared him to be a god. God judged Herod by killing him and having him eaten of worms. The Antichrist will be killed by God and thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation 19 verse 20, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, Mark 9 verse 44. Herod killed a member of the little flock, 12 colon 2, and the Antichrist will kill members of the little flock, 2, 12 24, with Herod out of the way, the word of God is growing in Jerusalem. The word of God, though, is different than it was when it grew in Jerusalem from Acts 2 to 6, because it is now the gospel of grace, not the gospel of the
kingdom. Therefore, instead of telling people they are saved by repenting and being water baptized, 238, the saints at Jerusalem are telling people they are saved by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for atonement of their sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Therefore, God's forgiveness of Israel, by Stephen's words, 7 hours 60 minutes, is having the same, initial effect that God's forgiveness of Israel, by Jesus' words had, Luke 23 verse 34. Namely, Jews in Jerusalem are being saved. However, just like Israel rejected God's offer of salvation in the kingdom program in Acts 2 to 7 three times, for 18, 540, and 759, we will see Israel reject God's offer of salvation in the grace program in Acts 13 to 28 three times, 1346, 18 colon 6, and 28 colon 27 28. 1225 Barnabas and Saul were in Jerusalem, delivering the gift that the Christians in Antioch had given them to give to the poor saints in Jerusalem, 11 colon 29 30. With that being done, they return to Antioch, 13, colon 1, with John Mark, as they meet another minister in Antioch with the congregation growing there. 13, Paul and Barnabas go on their first apostolic journey to proclaim salvation unto the ends of the earth, v. 47. Many believe, but there is opposition by religious leaders. That is okay, because their expelling of Paul and Barnabas just means that another region will now hear the gospel of grace. 13, colon 1, since the Gentile church in Antioch has grown to the point of having several prophets and teachers, the Antioch church is established, such that they do not need Saul. It is now time for him, as the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, to reach other Gentiles with the gospel of grace. 13, colon 2, ministered to the Lord. This is an interesting phrase. It means that they were furnishing or supplying the Lord. Since those saved were members of the body of Christ, preaching the gospel and mystery doctrine brings more people into the body of Christ and edifies current members of the body of Christ, meaning that the Lord is furnished with more and better functioning body parts. So, too, today, we are ministering to the Lord when we preach the gospel of grace. Also in this verse, the Holy Ghost separates out Barnabas and Saul to deliver the gospel of grace to reach Jews and Gentiles with the gospel of grace in other territories. The twelve apostles are not called to do this work, because they are part of the kingdom program. They will be sitting on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, Matthew 19 verse 28. Barnabas was also saved under the kingdom program, for 36, but, not having a promised position like the twelve apostles, God has him help Paul with spreading the gospel of grace. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. As such, he does the preaching. Barnabas' role is to be a consoler of Paul, as 436 says. Given the great physical trials Paul would face, e.g., the list in 2 Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 28, Paul would definitely need some consoling. Therefore, God has called Paul to spread the gospel of grace to the unsaved, and Barnabas will go along to console him. Meanwhile, the Twelve Apostles' ministry is to edify those saved under the Kingdom program. We see Paul and the Twelve Apostles come to such a conclusion in Galatians 2 verse 9, albeit this conclusion is reached after Paul and Barnabas go out. 13 colon 3 Fasting and Praying in order to hear from the Lord what one should do or in order for someone to receive physical healing, should not be followed today. The reason is because God speaks today through His Word and He does not bring physical healing upon people, because God's Word is complete, 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 to 10. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4 verse 13, is found in that completed Word. Therefore, God treats us like full-grown, adult sons, Galatians 4 verses 5 to 7, who can make decisions based upon God's completed word, rather than having to wait for some inner impression and confirmation from circumstances that God wants us to do a certain thing. At the time of 13, colon 2, however, no mystery doctrine had been written down. Therefore, the fasting and praying were necessary. 13, 5 Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, 
but he was also sent to the children of Israel. 9.15 When Stephen asked God not to charge Israel with his stoning, 7 hours 60 minutes, God granted that request by having Paul go to the Jew first, with the Gospel of Grace, Romans 1 verse 16. Therefore, the pattern we will see Paul following in Acts is that, when he comes to a city, he will preach the Gospel in the Jewish synagogue first, then, he will go to the Gentiles. This verse also mentions that John was ministering with them. This would be John Mark, 1225 and 1537, the writer of the book of Mark. He was not one of the twelve apostles. 13, 6 12 This story demonstrates the condition of Israel at the time. They are in satanic captivity by the hand of the Jewish religious leaders, as represented by Bar Jesus, even though they think they are following God. The Jewish religious leaders try to turn Israel away from the gospel of grace, just like Elimas tries to do here. God reveals the truth through a miracle, and now Israel knows their religious system is false. Therefore, they have to make a choice. Those trying to follow God will make the choice that C.G.S. Paulus does, i.e., believe the gospel of the grace of God. The miracle is of blinding Elimas, which is a type of how God blinded the Jewish religious leaders to the truth, since they were already in unbelief, John 12 verses 37 to 40. Note that the blinding was only for a season, meaning that Israel now has a renewed opportunity to be saved under the new dispensation. 13, 6 7 Satan has a stronghold in Paphos. A man named Bar Jesus is there, which means son of Jesus, but he is no son of Jesus Christ, because he is a false prophet. Satan is so good at deception that a prudent man, Sergius Paulus, had been fooled by this Bar Jesus such that he believes Bar Jesus and wants Bar Jesus to get Barnabas and Saul to speak to him. In other words, this prudent man thinks Bar Jesus is God's man, not Satan's man, such that he thinks that Bar Jesus and Saul are on the same side. Note that Bar Jesus is called a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew. 13, 6. The Jews were following their religion, which was not of God. They spoke in God's name, which made them false prophets. It also made them sorcerers, because they were bewitching people, Galatians 3 verse 1, into thinking they are obeying God. Therefore, Bar Jesus is mentioned, here, because he is a type of the Jewish religion, which is keeping common Jews from believing the gospel. 13, 8 Bar Jesus means son of Jesus, so how could his name, by interpretation, be Elimas the sorcerer? My guess is that the interpretation is God's interpretation. Men call him son of Jesus, because they have been bewitched into thinking that his doctrine is the same as Jesus' doctrine, but God calls him what he is a sorcerer. Since he tries to get Sergius Paulus not to believe the gospel preached by Paul, he is on Satan's side. He is a deceitful worker, who has transformed himself into an apostle of Christ, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 13. 13 colon 9, from now on, Saul is called Paul. Saul is Hebrew, and Paul is Greek. People will say that he is called Paul now, because he goes to the Gentiles. However, he still goes to the Jew first, through the end of Acts. If Paul means he is going to the Gentiles, the name change would not be found at all in Acts. In my opinion, God changes Saul's name to Paul at this moment, because it is at this time that he is filled with the Holy Ghost to go on his apostolic journeys to fulfill the commission that Jesus Christ gave him in 915. Since Saul had blasphemed the Holy Ghost, 758 and 8, 1, perhaps God is giving him a clean slate at this time under the new name of Paul. 13, 10-11 Anyone who claims that the Holy Ghost is still doing today what he did back in early Acts, need only look at these verses to see this is not true. No one can know the heart of man in order to pronounce him to be a child of the devil today like this and subsequently have that person struck with blindness. Many parallels exist in Peter's ministry and Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. In 8, 20-21, Peter rebuked a sorcerer. Here, Paul rebukes a sorcerer. 13.12 Sergius Paulus believes, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. He had been told by the Jews that he had to follow the traditions of the Jews in order to have eternal life.
This was a grievous burden, Matthew 23 verse 4. Paul told him that he only had to believe. He did not have to do anything whatsoever. Working for eternal life got him nowhere. Now, believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for his sins gives him eternal life and a position in heavenly places. This free gift of eternal life, Romans 6 verse 23, is probably what astonished him. 1313 John Mark departs to Jerusalem. His departure is briefly mentioned here, but it will cause Paul and Barnabas to split up later. In 1536, Paul wants Barnabas to go with him to revisit the cities where they have preached the word of the Lord. Barnabas wants to take John Mark, but Paul does not want to take John Mark because he left them in 1313. This contention is so sharp that Barnabas and Mark go on their own journey while Paul teams up with Silas 15, 36-41. Thus, this little note about John Mark departing to Jerusalem has long-term consequences. The good news, though, is that John Mark will mature spiritually over time, because, later on, Paul says that Mark is profitable to me for the ministry, 2 Timothy 4 verse 11. 13, 14-16 Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, but he was also to minister to the children of Israel, 9:15. God had determined that the Jews should be given an opportunity to believe the gospel of grace first. Romans 1 verse 16. Therefore, Paul's pattern was to go to the Jewish synagogue once he had entered a city, preach the gospel to the Jews, and then go to the Gentiles after the Jews had rejected the gospel. As such, Jews will have no excuse when they stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on Judgment Day. In a Jewish synagogue, it was customary for the leaders to allow visitors to speak to the congregation, especially someone like Paul, who had some clout, being a Jew and having learned the Jewish traditions from Gamaliel, 22, 3, a doctor of the Jewish law, 534. Therefore, the way Paul reached the devout Jews with the gospel of the grace of God was by going into the synagogue and waiting for his turn to speak. Then, he preached Jesus Christ to them, they kicked him out, and he went to the Gentiles in that city. Granted, there were some Jews who did believe, but most did not, because the hardest person in the world to save is a religious person. 13,17-23 Paul starts Israel's history with their time in Egypt so as to link the promised land, Canaan, with the promised king, David, with the promised Messiah, Jesus. To bring Israel into the promised land, God had to drive out the heathen Canaanites. In order to give Israel an eternal king, David, he had to drive out the heathen king Saul. In order to give Israel redemption with their promised Messiah, God had to drive out the heathen religious leaders and replace them with the believing remnant. This should show the Jews that Jesus is the promised Messiah. 1317 Paul speaks to the Jews, being a Jew himself. Therefore, he refers to Israel's fathers as our fathers. Paul is going to show the Jews that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Messiah, as prophesied in Old Testament scripture. These people listen to the scripture, having read the law and the prophets earlier, 1315. If they believe that the law and the prophets are the word of God, as opposed to just going through the ritual of going to the synagogue, they will realize that what Paul is saying, regarding Jesus being their Messiah, is true. The high arm that God used to bring Israel out of Egypt is actually a reference to Jesus Christ. He is the arm of the Lord in Isaiah 53 verse 1. Exodus 15 verse 3 says that the Lord is a man of war, and the only man of the Godhead is Jesus Christ. Therefore, although he was not born yet, it was Jesus Christ, as the man of war and high arm, who brought Israel out of Egypt. He will also make war and destroy Israel's enemies at his second coming at the end of the tribulation period. Revelation 19 verse 11. 1320 Sometimes, people will say that the 450 years of Judges is a Bible contradiction, because 1 Kings 6 verse 1 says that there were only 480 years from the time Israel left Egypt to the fourth year of Solomon's reign, 
and so the 450 years of Judges seems to be too long based on 1 Kings 6 verse 1. However, there is no contradiction here. Without going into a long explanation, the simple answer is that Paul is counting the entire period of the Judges, while 1 Kings 6 verse 1 deducts approximately 114 years of those 450 years in which Israel was under a non-Jewish ruler, due to their rebellion against God. Therefore, just like with all supposed Bible contradictions, rather than being a contradiction, the difference is actually a proof that the Bible is God's word. After all, if man wrote it, he would have made sure to word things similarly in both places so as not to create an apparent contradiction. 13 21 22 In 1 Samuel 8, Israel had rejected God as their king, wanting a king like all the nations. So, God gave them what they requested. He gave them Saul, their choice for a king. Then, God removed him and gave Israel God's choice for a king, David, who would sit on the throne forever, 2 Samuel 7 verse 16. 13.23, the promise, that Paul refers to, here, is the Davidic covenant. In 2 Samuel 7 verses 12 to 13, God promised to establish the kingdom of David's son forever. Here, Paul says that that promised son is the Savior, Jesus. 1324, John the Baptist preached a different gospel than what Paul is preaching. John preached the baptism of repentance, which meant that he preached to Israel to repent or change their mind, abandoning Jewish traditions and embracing God's law covenant with them, being water baptized at the same time, Mark 1 verses 4 to 5, to save themselves from the apostate nation, which is called this untoward generation, 240. 1325 John said that, not only was he not Israel's Messiah, but he was also not worthy to participate in the kinsman redeemer process. That is what is meant by the phrase, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose, see Ruth 4 verses 7 to 9. Therefore, John was just a preacher, he was not the Messiah, who would sit on David's throne forever. Granted, he was a greater prophet than all other previous prophets, Matthew 11 verse 11, because he preached the kingdom of God. However, since he was a man, he was no better of a person than anyone else. 1326, the gospel of grace is sent to the Jew first, Romans 1 verse 16. That is why Paul first addresses children of the stock of Abraham. The Gentiles will hear the gospel from Paul on the next Sabbath day, 1342. 1327 Paul makes it clear that the Jewish religious leaders are guilty of killing their Messiah for which they have no excuse, since they read the Old Testament scriptures every Sabbath day. Therefore, they should have been like Simeon, who was waiting for the consolation of Israel, Luke 2 verse 25. Instead, they were part of Herod's effort to try to kill Jesus as a baby, Matthew 2 verses 4 to 6, and they ultimately did crucify him on a cross by wicked hands, 2:23. 1328, speaking of his death, Paul also shows that the Jewish religious leaders killed their Messiah unjustly. That is, they broke the law, killing him without a cause, John 15 verse 25. 1329 in 1327, Paul says that Jesus' earthly ministry showed Israel that he fulfilled Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. Now, Paul says that Jesus' death on the cross also fulfilled Old Testament prophecies regarding the death of the Messiah. That is, he became accursed of God by hanging on a tree, Deuteronomy 21 verse 23, and he made his grave with the wicked and the rich, Isaiah 53 verse 9. Therefore, Israel should have believed the gospel at his crucifixion. 1331 Not only did Israel have Old Testament testimony regarding the Messiah's life and death that showed that Jesus is the Messiah, but they also had eyewitness testimonies of his resurrection. Therefore, Israel should have believed the gospel during the Holy Ghost's ministry to Israel in Acts 2-7. 1332 Gospel means glad tidings or good news. Therefore, in spite of Israel's rejection of their Messiah's life, 1327, death, 1329, and resurrection, 1331, they still have an opportunity to receive eternal life in this new dispensation of grace. 13,32-34 The promise which was made unto the fathers is the promise of eternal life. God hath fulfilled. 
War hath made eternal life possible by raising Jesus from the dead to die no more. This is the assurance to Israel that he can do the same for them. That is why the mercies of David are sure. The term sure mercies of David is a quote of Isaiah 55 verse 3 and is a reference to the new covenant that God will make with Israel in which he will place his spirit within them and cause them to do God's law. Ezekiel 36 verses 26 to 27. Since they will obey God's law perfectly, David's mercies are sure, because there is no way that saved Israel can disobey God's law and fall out of those mercies. As 1 John 3 verse 9 says, he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Of course, this does not happen until Jesus establishes God's kingdom on earth at his second coming. 1333, this quote of Psalm 2 verse 7 shows that the day God begot Jesus was at his resurrection. At the same time, Hebrews 1 verses 5 to 6 seems to quote Psalm 2 verse 7 to apply to his earthly birth, as does John 1 verses 14 and 18 and John 3 verses 16 and 18. It appears, then, that Jesus was born or begotten of the Father at his birth, and he was also begotten of the Father at his resurrection. Thus, he was born again at his resurrection, which is required to enter into the kingdom of God, John 3 verses 3 and 5. This makes sense because Jesus, the man, was forsaken by God at the cross when the sin of the world was placed upon him, Psalm 22 verse 1 and Matthew 27 verse 46. Therefore, he died. This is why 1333 says that the Father hath raised up Jesus again. He raised him up at his birth, and he raised him up again at his resurrection. 2 Timothy 2 verse 8 says that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to Paul's gospel. In other words, Jesus, the man, had faith in what God told him to do, which was to die on the cross. And, because Jesus had faith, he pleased God, Hebrews 11 verse 6, and so Jesus was raised from the dead, according to his own death on the cross. In other words, since Jesus was made sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, that sin had to receive atonement in order to raise Jesus from the dead. God applied the blood of Christ to that sin because Jesus had faith in what God told him to do, just like God applies the blood of Christ to our sin because we have faith in what God has told us to do i.e., trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. 13 colon 34 dash 35 13 35 is a quote of Psalm 16 verse 10, which says that thine holy one would not see corruption. 13 34 says that, when God raised Jesus from the dead, he did so now no more to return to corruption. He must have been in corruption in order for him not to return to corruption. So, how did Jesus go to corruption when Psalm 16 verse 10 said he would not see corruption? The answer is an understanding that Jesus, the man, received corruption by suffering in hell as the payment for our sins. Jesus says, in Psalm 22 verse 6, that he is a worm, and Mark 9 verses 43 to 44 says that hell is the place where their worm dieth not. Therefore, Jesus, the man, reduced down to a worm in hell, to pay for our sins. But, thine holy one would be Jesus, as God. Thus, as God, Jesus did not suffer in hell. God kept the deity part of Jesus pure, because, as God, he did not see corruption, but the man part of Jesus had to be corrupted in order to pay. For our sins. Then, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, Jesus, as man, would not return to corruption, because the sin debt had already been paid. Therefore, if God can raise from the dead the man, Jesus, who actually took our sin payment, then surely he can raise all believers from the dead, because we will never have to suffer hell. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 13 colon 36 37 because David was a believer, he went to Abraham's bosom. Therefore, he did not suffer in the torment side of hell. This would be part of the sure mercies of David, 1334. However, he suffered corruption in the sense that his body decayed in the grave. We are told that it was God's will that David fell on sleep. That is because there will be some believers still alive at the rapture. 
Therefore, for those believers, it will not be God's will that they fall on sleep. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. Since Jesus saw no corruption, 1337, this also probably means that Jesus' body never decayed any during the three days he was in the grave. This would be a miracle in itself, since a body normally stinks after being dead for four days. John 11 verse 39. 13, 38-39 Forgiveness of sins comes to Israel now, in the dispensation of grace, by believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for the atonement of sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3-4. Note the difference between this gospel and the gospel of the kingdom. Under the gospel of grace, all that believe are justified from all things, 1339. Under the gospel of the kingdom, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16 verse 16. In this passage, Paul also shows the point of the law. The law cannot justify someone. It just sets up the perfect, holy standard by which someone must live to have eternal life on his own, Romans 7 verse 12. Since all have sinned, Romans 3 verse 23, falling short of that perfect standard, the law shows the need for a savior to give God's imputed righteousness to the believer in order to receive the gift of eternal life, Romans 6 verse 23. 1341 Paul quotes Habakkuk 1 verse 5. The context of Habakkuk 1 verse 5 shows that the work God is referring to is the Babylonians taking over the land of Israel. Habakkuk 1 verse 6. That happened during Daniel's day, but it will also happen in the tribulation period when the Antichrist rises up and restores Babylon as the world power. Thus, the warning here to Israel is that, if they despise the grace God is offering them, they will perish by making a covenant with the Antichrist. Daniel 9 verses 26 to 27. Obviously, this did not happen while these Israelites were alive. Therefore, the word you're in the phrase in your days must refer to apostate Israel, i.e., the generation of vipers, Matthew 23 verse 33, who will still be in apostasy during the tribulation period. Even though these particular Jews will go to the grave before then, they will still be subject to God's wrath at the great white throne judgment if they do not believe the gospel of grace before they die. Therefore, they should heed this warning by Paul and believe. 1342 There were some Gentiles in Paul's audience in the Jewish synagogue, as evidenced by his reference in 13, 16, 26 to those present who fear God. Therefore, although Paul was speaking primarily to Jews, it was the Gentiles who listened and wanted their Gentile friends to hear the gospel of grace, as well. This establishes a pattern that we will see throughout the rest of the book of Acts, that the Jews, for the most part, will reject the gospel of grace, while the Gentiles will be anxious to hear it, because, for the first time since Genesis 11, the middle wall of partition has been taken down, Ephesians 2 verse 14. 1343 From what is said, we can determine that the Jews and religious proselytes of this verse refers to members of the little flock. Therefore, many of those saved under the kingdom program understand that God has changed the program and are persuading Paul and Barnabas to continue preaching the gospel of grace. This is a major change in thinking among the little flock. Note that Paul tells the little flock to continue in the grace of God. For them, this means that they are to continue in the doctrine that relates to their program. Since they were saved as part of Israel's program, they should continue in. that program in order to receive the promises that God gave them at the time they were saved. If Paul did not mean this, he would not have told them to continue. Rather, he would have said to believe and learn the doctrine that relates to the new, mystery dispensation. Just because the new dispensation is often called the grace dispensation, does not mean that God did not give grace in Israel's program as well. For example, Hebrews 4 verse 16 tells the Hebrews to approach the throne of grace, and Peter tells the little flock to grow in grace, 2 Peter 3 verse 18. Therefore, we should not see the grace word and immediately think grace dispensation. Rather, we must read the context surrounding that word to determine that they are to continue in the grace of God that he gave Israel in their program and to grow in that grace, i.e., grow in kingdom doctrine. 
Meanwhile, unbelieving Israel has the opportunity to be saved under the mystery program, since God's promises to believers have now changed, due to the change in dispensation. 1345 From what is said, we can determine that the Jews of this verse are the Jewish religious leaders of the apostate nation of Israel. Rather than wanting to know the truth, they act on their feeling of envy of Paul, because nearly the whole city has come to hear him. 1344. This shows how anxious people are to get out of bondage, to sin. If only they would overcome the flesh and believe the message of grace. These Jews contradicted Paul's message, which means that they must have said something like, God does not give you eternal life as a free gift. You must do the things that he says to do. You must obey the law. They also blasphemed, which means that they probably said something like, Jesus was a good man, but he was not God. Such statements should sound familiar to us, as most of Christianity includes some kind of works in order to maintain or prove your salvation, while all other religions do not believe that Jesus is God. Thus, 2,000 years afterward, the attacks against God's free gift of eternal life has not changed, because the envy by the flesh of the things of the Spirit also has not changed. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 17. 1346, this is the first strike against the Jews in the dispensation of grace. God has offered salvation by grace to Israel, and they have rejected it here. Therefore, in this city, Paul will now speak to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. By rejecting the gospel, the Jews have deemed themselves unworthy of everlasting life. This does not mean that they are not good enough to receive everlasting life. Rather, it means that they would rather die in their sins than to deny the flesh's efforts by accepting the gift of eternal life from God by doing absolutely nothing to earn it. Jesus warned his apostles that people would do this when he told them to go out and preach the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. A city is worthy of the gospel only if they believe it, Matthew 10 verse 13. Note that Paul says that it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Thus, it was God's plan for Paul to come to a city, preach to the Jew first, and then go to the Gentiles with the gospel. 1347 The previous three references in scripture of being a light to the Gentiles are found in Isaiah 42, 6, 49, 6, and Luke 2 verse 32. All three refer to the Messiah being a light to the Gentiles, meaning that salvation would go to the Jews first and then the Jews would preach to the Gentiles. This is under the Kingdom program. Now that the grace dispensation has begun, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, says that these scriptures are fulfilled by the gospel of grace going to the Jews first and then preaching the gospel to the Gentiles afterward. This shows that, in spite of Israel's rejection of the Kingdom program, God is still sending salvation unto the ends of the earth through the Apostle Paul. In other words, God will not keep the Gentiles from receiving the offer of eternal life, just because Israel has rejected eternal life themselves. 1348 This verse is not talking about the individual predestination of believers, which is false doctrine, since we have to make a free will choice to receive eternal life. Rather, it is saying that those who make that free will choice to believe are ordained to eternal life. Otherwise, if individual predestination were true, why would Paul even preach and suffer as a result? Why not just stay at home, knowing that God has predestinated certain people to have eternal life, regardless of what Paul does? No, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10 verse 14, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. Therefore, Paul preaches to as many as he can reach, so that he might by all means save some, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 22, even though this means that he must suffer great things for Jesus' name, 9 16. 13 colon 48 49, this shows God's plan for people to be saved. They hear the gospel and believe. Then, they tell the gospel to those they know, such that the gospel is published throughout all the region, 1349. 1350 The persecution that Paul and Barnabas received largely came from the Jewish religious leaders. Just like with Jesus in Matthew, John, and the twelve apostles in Acts 2-7, the Jewish religious leaders are threatened by God taking over their congregations. 
So, too, today, Christian denominations pervert the word of God so that they have control over their congregations, rather than God. Then, when you believe the truth, they kick you out of their congregations and defame you. These same people preach tolerance from the pulpit, which to them means that we should tolerate their false doctrine, but they will not tolerate the truth when we speak it. 1351 Since the Jews in Antioch of Pisidia have deemed themselves unworthy of eternal life, Paul goes to the next city, Iconium, with the gospel. This is not unlike what Jesus told the twelve in Matthew 10 verse 14, And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. 1352 The disciples were filled with joy. This would not be the twelve disciples, who Jesus chose in Matthew, John, because we are now in a different dispensation. Rather, it would be those discipled by Paul with mystery doctrine, as seen at the church in Antioch in 1126. It probably refers to the disciples at the city Paul just left, which would be Antioch in Pisidia, 1314. Paul and Barnabas were expelled from the Jewish synagogue, 1350, yet the disciples were filled with joy. This shows that joy is not dependent upon circumstances. This is why we can rejoice evermore, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16, even in the midst of persecution. Happiness is dependent upon happenings, but joy is dependent upon the inward. Man. 14 Paul preaches in several cities, and the Jews persecute him to the point of stoning him to death, b. 19. However, God uses his death to let him see the third heaven and learn more mystery doctrine, 2 Corinthians 12 verses 2 to 4. Then, he raises him from the dead, v. 20, and many Gentiles are being saved as he goes from city to city with the gospel of grace, v. 27. 14, 1 2 Again, Paul follows God's commandment to him to preach the gospel of grace in the Jewish synagogue first before going to the Gentiles. Many Jews and Gentiles believe. Note the craftiness of the unbelieving Jews. They get unbelieving Gentiles to think that believing Gentiles and Jews are evil, such that now both unbelieving Jews and Gentiles are against Paul and Barnabas. To make Gentiles believe that believing Gentiles are evil, the unbelieving Jews must have told them of the lawless gospel that Paul preached. They probably complained that those believing Gentiles cannot be trusted if they believe a gospel that says that they are no longer under the law, Romans 6 verse 14. How, then, can those believers be trusted? Thus, evil Jews, cause evil Gentiles, to believe that justified Gentiles are the evil ones. In 1028, we learned from Peter that it was unlawful for a Jew to come unto a Gentile. Then, in 11, 2-3, Jewish members of the little flock contended with Peter for going against the law in coming unto a Gentile. This is significant to note because this background information shows the irony of what is going on here in 14, 1-2. The unbelieving Jews, in 14, 2, would be part of the Jewish religion, since they heard Paul speak in the Jewish synagogue. Therefore, these same people had Jesus crucified and had Peter arrested for supposedly breaking the law. Yet they have no problem with breaking the law themselves. This shows that they really do not care about being good, law-abiding Jews. Rather, they just care about putting down all threats to their religion, even if the threat, in this case, comes from what God is doing. The same thing goes on in Christianity today. The Christian religion will complain that right dividers are going against scripture with their beliefs, yet they will use unscriptural methods to try to silence the Bible believers. 14,3-4 Note that Paul and Barnabas stayed in Iconium for a long time because there was a large group of believers and a large group of unbelievers. The believers have God's word plus signs and wonders to confirm the message, much like Jews had when Jesus sent the disciples out with the gospel after his resurrection, Mark 16 verse 20. Therefore, it is clear that Paul and Barnabas are speaking God's word. Yet many people respect the high standing of the Jewish religious leaders over God's word. Therefore, they do not believe. The result is a divided crowd. 14, 5, God does not try to force people to believe him, but Satan will use any means necessary to get people on his side. 
since Satan's forces can do nothing against the truth, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8, they will usually try to silence or kill the messengers of the truth. Therefore, Satan's crowd begins attacking the believers, such that they try to kill them with stones. Both Jews and Gentiles are trying to get rid of the gospel of grace. 14, 6-7 There are plenty more places where Paul can preach the gospel. Therefore, he flees from Iconium and goes to Lycaonia. 14, 8 This man is symbolic of the Gentiles. Spiritually speaking, they have never walked, since they were always on the wrong side of the middle wall of partition. Just like this man was healed physically, God wants to heal the Gentiles spiritually, such that they become members of the body of Christ. 14 colon 9 If you have a physical ailment, you pray for God to heal you, and He does not heal you. People like to use this verse to show that the reason God did not heal was due to a lack of faith on your part. However, the faith that Paul perceived here is not the faith to be healed physically, but the faith to be healed spiritually. Paul had preached the gospel, 14 colon 7. This man heard Paul speak, 14, colon 9. Salvation comes by believing the gospel. Paul perceived that the man had the faith to be healed spiritually. Therefore, Paul healed him physically, because his physical healing would give him the opportunity to tell those who knew him about his spiritual healing. This man represents those who believe the gospel. If they do not believe, they are not healed spiritually. Paul did not want to heal him if he did not have the faith to be healed spiritually, since, spiritually speaking, he would still be foot impotent. Paul has the physical match the spiritual as a sign to those watching that God can do the same thing for them spiritually if they just believe the gospel. 14.10 The man is not deaf, but Paul speaks with a loud voice to draw attention to all around of the miracle that God is performing as a sign of what the gospel of grace can do for them spiritually speaking. 14, 11 13 This reaction may seem terrible, and it is. However, it is no different than the Jews' reaction. The Jews had their own religion and tried to make Jesus king, John 6 verse 15. When he would not let them do so, they abandoned him, John 6 verse 66. Later, they were persuaded by the Jewish religious leaders to crucify him, John 19 verse 16. Similarly, these Gentiles see the miracle and want to make gods out of Paul and Barnabas. They will then abandon them, 1418, and then be persuaded by the Jews to stone Paul to death, 1419. This is a good example of what man usually does when confronted with the truth of God's word. He either rejects it, like those in Iconium, who tried to stone Paul, 14, colon 5, or he tries to make it fit into his religious system. Either way, the truth of God is rejected for Satan's lie program. The greatest crime a person can do is to tear down another person's religion, because it destroys the self that they have applied to their guilty consciences, and they are confronted with the stark reality that they are still sinners. bound for hell. Rather than admit that their own religion is wrong, religious people will use whatever means necessary to expel the truth-teller, including killing him. Note also that the Greeks worshipped the planets as gods, 1412. As such, they worshipped the host of heaven. Also, note that their religious system mimicked the one god set up, as they sacrificed animals, 1413. Satan is the great imitator of God. The more his lie program mimics the truth, the more people will fall for it and reject the truth, should it be presented to them. We should also note the irony in the statement, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men, 1411. The true God came down to earth in the likeness of man not too long before this, and man crucified him. 14,14-18 Barnabas and Paul had to strip naked to prove they are men, not gods and it was still difficult to keep the Gentiles from sacrificing to them as gods, 1418. This shows how, in spite of the evidence to the contrary, it is very difficult to get people to go against their own religion. Note the change in dispensations that Paul mentions here. In times past, God allowed the Gentiles to walk in their own ways. Paul explains this in Romans 1. 
The Gentiles were vain in their imaginations. Romans 1 verse 21, changed the truth of God into a lie. Romans 1 verse 25, and did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Romans 1 verse 28. Therefore, God gave them up to uncleanness. Romans 1 verse 24, gave them up unto vile affections. Romans 1 verse 26, and gave them over to a reprobate mind. Romans 1 verse 28. This happened in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. From Genesis 12 Acts 9, God suffered all nations to walk in their own ways, 1416. But now, he has given the Gentiles a gospel by which they can turn from these vanities unto the living God, 1415. For the first time in almost 2000 years, the Gentiles have direct access to God, and these Gentiles choose to continue in their idolatry. How sad! They continue to worship gods when they could turn unto the living God instead. 1417 Even after God gave up the Gentiles in Genesis 11, Gentiles could still see that there is a God in creation. Romans 1 verses 19 to 20 says that all people are without excuse when it comes to God, because He has placed His witness within every man that He is the Creator and worthy of worship. Therefore, Although these Gentiles were on the wrong side of the middle wall of partition before Acts 9, they could still be saved by recognizing the rain and food given to them by the Creator and worshipping Him. How sad that, in this day and age, people have God's completed word, and they still use their own vain imaginations to deny what they know is true in their hearts that there is a Creator. 1419 Paul is stoned to death and it is the religious Jews, who followed him from other cities, to kill him. Just like the religious leaders persuaded the common Jews to kill Jesus, the Jewish religious leaders, here, persuade the Gentiles to kill Paul. Evil is so powerful that, even evil from a competing religious system, can convince a different evil religious system to follow their marching orders in trying to get rid of God's man, Paul. Can you imagine, say, Muslims convincing Hindus to kill someone? In 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 to 4, Paul says that he was caught up into heaven and heard unlawful words. If they were unlawful words, they must have been grace words, which means that God revealed more of the mystery program to him at that time. The timing, compared with the events in Acts, seems to indicate that the time Paul was caught up into the third heaven was here. Paul, then, was stoned to death, he went to heaven, Jesus revealed more details of the mystery program to him, and he returned to earth, because God still had a job for him to do. Therefore, while being stoned to death sounds like about the worst thing that could happen, it actually benefited Paul and all believers with a further revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul experienced the true meaning of all things work together for good to them that love God, Romans 8 verse 28. Fourteen twenty. Paul has no qualms about preaching the gospel, even after he was stoned to death, because for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, Philippians 1 verse 21. Paul has already seen the gain awaiting him in heaven, and living means more people get to hear the grace message so that they may have eternal life in heaven, as well. Therefore, Paul gets right up and goes to the next city to preach the gospel of the grace of God, and then will go right back into the cities from which Jews just stoned him to death, 1421. Paul was already a bold man of God, but he becomes exceedingly bold from now on, with new information from Jesus to reveal to others and the first-hand knowledge of what heaven looks like. When you experience the joys of heaven, you will count the things of this life as dumb. Philippians 3 verse 8. Take it from someone who knows Paul. 14,22-23 Paul goes right back to the cities from which he had just been killed. After all, he now has some advanced doctrine from the Lord Jesus Christ that he can share with them. He can also establish churches there. 
Paul will not be with them long, since he is going to go from city to city, preaching the gospel. Therefore, Paul only comes back to establish the churches and give them new information. Now, these Gentile churches probably did not have great, learned men of scripture to lead them, as they were all new believers. Therefore, Jesus Christ probably supernaturally gave them apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, until the time when the Bible is complete when they could read the complete information about the mystery themselves. Ephesians 4 verses 11 to 13. Thus, God would teach them through these people with Paul not around. Therefore, although Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, he does not, single-handedly, give all the mystery doctrine to all the Gentiles. By the way, the kingdom of God, mentioned here, is not a reference to God's earthly kingdom. God's kingdom will encompass the entire universe. The heavenly realm is just as much a part of his kingdom as the earthly realm is. As such, we should not think that Paul is preaching the same message as Jesus was, just because he talks about God's kingdom here. Similarly, we should not think that Paul is referring to Israel's seven-year tribulation period, just because he uses the term tribulation here. 14, 26-28 Antioch is the place where believers were first called Christians, 1126, and it serves as sort of a hub for Paul's apostolic journeys. Certain prophets and teachers are there, and it is where Paul was sent out on his first apostolic journey, 13, 1-2. Therefore, he returns to them and reports what happened on his journey. For the Jews he went to, it is the same, old story of not many people being saved and the Jewish religion persecuting God's people. However, many Gentiles are being saved now. 15. Satan tries to bring contention within both the Gentile church headquarters, Antioch, and the Jewish church headquarters, Jerusalem. He also brings contention between Paul and Barnabas, v. 39. However, both of these plans of Satan fail. With the first plan, the Jews reject the bad doctrine of certain of the Pharisees within their midst, verses 23 to 24. With regard to Paul and Barnabas, two teams, instead of one team, go out with the gospel of the grace of God, verses 39 to 40. 15, 1-2 Christians, who read the story of the meeting in Jerusalem, tend to think of the big, Jerusalem council with all of the apostles as the power of the day, and Paul, a latecomer to the party, comes up to seek their approval for his ministry. However, the opposite is true. The truth of the matter is that Paul is coming to them to call them on the carpet. In fact, Jesus Christ specifically revealed to him that he needed to go up to Jerusalem to take care of the division there, Galatians 2 verse 2. Keep in mind that Luke is writing the book of Acts for Israel, while Paul writes the book of Galatians for the body of Christ, especially Gentiles. The two accounts give different details based upon these different perspectives. Therefore, while Luke says the little flock determined that Paul and Barnabas should go up to Jerusalem, 15, 2, Paul says that he went up to Jerusalem by revelation, Galatians 2 verse 2. Both statements are true. Paul has been preaching the gospel of grace that Jesus Christ gave to him by revelation, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12, and men came to him from Jerusalem, trying to corrupt grace believers by trying to put them back under the law. They told. The Gentile believers that they must be circumcised in order to have eternal life, but the Lord Jesus Christ has shown Paul that in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, Galatians 5 verse 6. In fact, if members of the body of Christ desire to get circumcised, Christ will profit them nothing, because they will become debtors to do the whole law, Galatians 5 verses 2 to 3. Therefore, Paul must go up to the Jerusalem church to set the apostles and elders straight, not the other way around. The no small dissension and disputation, 15, 2, that Paul had with these people from Jerusalem is described by Paul as being over false brethren, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, Galatians 2 verse 4. Therefore, Paul did not go to Jerusalem to receive approval of his ministry from the twelve apostles. 
Rather, he went there to warn them of these false brethren and to set the Jerusalem brethren straight so that they would not be led astray by false doctrine. 15 3 True brethren are joyful regarding the salvation of the Gentiles. They do not try to put them under the bondage of the Mosaic law. 15 4 5 14 years have passed since Paul was saved. Galatians 2 verse 1, which is why the apostles and elders in Jerusalem received Paul and Barnabas, whereas, before, they had trouble with Paul, 926. Now, we see that it is believing Pharisees, who are causing the trouble in Jerusalem. Unlike the Jewish religious leaders, they may have good intentions, but the result is that they are trying to bring the body of Christ under the law. When the Lord Jesus Christ told Paul that, ye are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. 15 colon 7 14 years have passed since Paul received the mystery, and there is still much disputing, 15 colon 7. The reason is because there is a great difference between the instructions that Jesus gave the little flock and the instructions that the Lord Jesus Christ gave us today through the Apostle Paul. The little flock was to obey the law of Moses, Matthew 23 verses 2 to 3. The body of Christ is told that we are not under the law, Romans 6 verse 14, because the law was taken out of the way, being nailed to Jesus' cross, Colossians 2 verse 14. God told Israel that they would be cut off from God if they were not circumcised, Genesis 17 verse 14. God told the body of Christ that circumcision does nothing for you, Galatians 6 verse 15. Such contrasts caused much disputing, even though the mystery dispensation had been going on for 14 years now. The fact that Christianity today says that Paul preached the same message as the Twelve Apostles shows their ignorance and resting of Scripture to their own destruction, 2 Peter 3 verse 16. It is probably for this reason that Peter had taken a 15-day course on the mystery program from Paul, Galatians 1 verse 18, God gave him a vision, showing that the Gentiles are clean, 10 colon 9-16, and Peter preached to Gentiles and saw them saved, 10 colon 34-44. Therefore, Peter is familiar with the mystery, and the fact that the middle wall of partition has come down, such that he will bridge the gap between the two groups here. The Jewish brethren are familiar with these things, too, as Peter shared the story with them, and they rejoiced over the Gentiles being saved, 11, 2-18. 15, 9, note the change in dispensation. Until Acts 9, God did put a distinction between Jew and Gentile. God says in Deuteronomy 4 verses 7 to 8 that Israel is the only nation who hath God so nigh unto them and that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law. By contrast, the Gentiles were in the dark, having to seek the Lord by feeling after him, 1727. Now, though, in the dispensation of grace, God hath put no difference between us and them, 15, 9. If Christianity denies the great change that took place in Acts 9, then they deny God and his word. 1510 The Lord Jesus Christ put the yoke of the law upon believers when he was on earth, when he said, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, Matthew 23 verses 2 to 3. Now, in the dispensation of grace, with regard to the Mosaic law, God says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, Galatians 5 verse 1. God says that ye are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. If man, then, puts the yoke of the law upon saved people, he is tempting God, meaning that he is trying to get God to sin by trying to get him to go back on his promise to the body of Christ by disobeying his commandment not to put themselves back under the law, Deuteronomy 6 verses 16 to 17. This, again, shows the change in dispensation. In the kingdom program, Israel was to teach God's commandments to their children, bind them on their hands, and write them on their doorposts, Deuteronomy 6 verses 7 to 9. In time past, they would have been obeying God by teaching believers the law. 
Now, these Pharisees are disobeying God by trying to bring the Gentiles under the law. Since the little flock, who was to obey the law, would be tempting God by putting the body of Christ under the law, how much more is Christianity, who is not to obey the law, tempting God when they put Christians under the law today? Also, note that Peter says that even saved Israel could not bear the yoke of the Mosaic law. So, why, then, did Jesus say that his yoke is easy and his burden is light? Matthew 11 verse 30 Although Jesus put the yoke of the Mosaic law upon Israel, he was not referring to them earning salvation by obeying that law. Rather, he was saying that the Pharisees were trying to work their way into God's kingdom. That was a heavy burden and grievous to be borne, Matthew 23 verse 3, because their self-righteousness was not good enough to bring them into God's kingdom, Matthew 5 verse 20. Jesus was saying to put themselves under the Mosaic law, but, in so doing, they would be trusting in Jesus' perfect obedience of the law to remove them from the curse of the law. Therefore, although they would still be under the Mosaic law, they would not be required to obey it, because no one can obey it perfectly. It is their faith in God's promise to them to give them eternal life through that law that would keep God from imputing their sin to them, when they disobeyed the law, Psalm 32 verses 1 to 2. What Peter is saying, then, is that the believing Pharisees are trying to put the body of Christ under the law as a means of obtaining righteousness. After all, they stated that, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses. Ye cannot be saved, 15, colon 1. Paul says that every man that is circumcised, Galatians 5 verse 3, is trying to be justified by the law, Galatians 5 verse 4. Therefore, Peter will say in the next verse, 1511, that all people, regardless of dispensation, are saved by grace, even those under the Mosaic law. The reason is because those, under the Mosaic law, are not trying to earn their salvation by their obedience of the Mosaic law. If the believing Pharisees put the body of Christ under the Mosaic law, they would be putting them under the self-righteous aspect of the law, which is a burden that neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, 1510. Note that Peter uses the past tense, which shows that, although they are still under the Mosaic Law, 2120, they are no longer bearing the burden of trying to be saved by their own obedience of the Mosaic Law. Rather, they are trusting in God's imputed righteousness by grace through Jesus' perfect obedience of that law on their behalf. 1511 Peter, and the other members of the little flock, were saved by believing the gospel of the kingdom, which was to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, 238. They were not saved by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins. However, regardless of the dispensation, all are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, because it is God's unmerited favor towards someone that brings them into heaven, and the power to bring them into heaven was brought about by Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross for sins. Thus, Peter, and the rest of the little flock, repented and were water baptized, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will give them eternal life. Those saved in the dispensation of grace trusted in Jesus' death as atonement for their sins, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will give them eternal life, also. The difference between the programs can still be seen, even in this verse, because Peter says that the little flock shall be saved, which happens at Jesus' second coming, 3 colon 19-20. Those, under the gospel of grace, are already saved, having now received the atonement, Romans 5 verse 11. Similarly, Jesus Christ's grace saves the body of Christ right now from having to obey the law, while his grace does not save the little flock from the Mosaic law until Jesus' second coming. Even if they break the Mosaic law, though, sin will not be imputed unto them, Psalm 32 verses 1 to 2. Because they please God by having faith in God's promise to give them eternal life in the kingdom, Hebrews 11 verse 6, and not by obeying the law. Yet, they are still under the law, since they made the law covenant with God, Exodus 19 verse 8, and God will not break his promises to them, Hebrews 6 verse 18. 1513, James speaks longer than Peter did, nine verses, compared with five verses. This shows the change in dispensations. In Israel's program, God gave the keys to the kingdom to Peter, Matthew 16 verses 18 to 19. Therefore, 
Peter alone speaks to crowds in Acts 2 verses 14 to 40, 3 verses 4 to 6, 3 verses 12 to 26, 4 verses 8 to 20, 5 verses 3 to 9, and 5 colon 29-32. Now, for the first time, Peter is seen as no longer being the leader of the little flock. He just gives his testimony. James is the one who gives the sentence, 1519, the conclusion, and dismisses Paul and Barnabas, 15, colon 29-30. Therefore, James is now the leader of the little flock, even though he is not even one of the twelve apostles, since the James of the twelve was killed in 12, colon 2. This shows that Peter no longer holds the keys to the kingdom. Therefore, a dispensational change has taken place. 1514 James does not call Peter, Peter. He calls him Simeon. Simeon is a variant upon the name Simon. Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter, because he gave him the authority to let people in or keep people out of God's kingdom, Matthew 16 verses 17 to 19. Now that the kingdom program has been set aside, so has Peter's authority, such that James calls him Simeon. In fact, this is the last time Peter is mentioned by name in the book of Acts, regardless of what name is used, because God's apostle in the dispensation of grace is Paul, not Peter, although Peter does remain an apostle to the little flock, Galatians 2 verse 9. 15 colon 15 18 James says that the words of the prophets agree with what has just happened, in that the Gentiles have been saved, 1514. Then, he quotes Amos 9 verses 11 to 12, except that his interpretation is much different from the original. Amos 9 verses 11 to 12 says, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of. Edom, and of all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. A Bible believer in Israel would take this passage to mean that, after God has physically destroyed the unbelievers in Israel, Amos 9 verses 7 to 10, which would take place during the tribulation period, God would raise up his tabernacle in the kingdom so that the believers in Israel can possess the saved Gentiles in God's eternal kingdom on earth. Such an interpretation is entirely consistent with Old Testament prophecy. However, James quotes this passage as saying, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Based on the new, mystery dispensation, that began with Paul in Acts 9, a Bible believer would interpret this passage as saying that the unbelievers in Israel were spiritually destroyed at the stoning of Stephen. In other words, Amos 9 verses 7 to 10 was really fulfilled in Acts 7, rather than being fulfilled at Jesus' second coming. Then, the raising up of the tabernacle of David occurred with God's call of Paul with the mystery gospel in Acts 9 and not with Jesus' second coming. Therefore, it was a spiritual raising up, giving Israel a renewed opportunity to be saved under the dispensation of grace. Then, instead of believing Israel possessing the Gentiles, the quote is changed to say that this renewed opportunity gives the residue of men, i.e., unsaved Jews, and all Gentiles the opportunity to be saved in the new dispensation of grace. Therefore, the interpretation of Amos 9 verses 11 to 12 has been vastly changed from the original. That is okay, because it is the Holy Spirit, through James, c. 1528, who made this change. And, God will still fulfill the original intent of this passage in Israel's program after the rapture. Therefore, God did not lie. However, there is absolutely no way anyone would have ever figured out James' interpretation of Amos 9 verses 11 to 12 before the mystery was revealed to Paul in Acts 9. That is why, after quoting this passage, James says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, 1518. In other words, although man had no idea that Amos 9 verses 11 to 12 meant that, God knew, when he wrote. It, that it meant that, because God knows all his works from the beginning of the world. By contrast, man did not know that interpretation because God's mystery program was kept secret since the world began, Romans 16 verse 25. 
Incidentally, Amos 9 verse 6 says that God builds his stories in the heaven, which is another reference to the mystery program. Again, no man would have figured that out, but God knew he was referring to the mystery program there in Amos. James' quote of Amos 9 verses 11 to 12 should be proof positive that the mystery was not revealed to man until Acts 9. After all, James quotes Amos 9 verses 11 to 12 as proof that the salvation of the Gentiles in the mystery dispensation was part of God's plan all along, and there is no way anyone would figure that out from the original. Therefore, the mystery must have been kept secret in the Old Testament. In other words, if the mystery was not a secret in the Old Testament, James would have been able to use a clear quote from the Old Testament, rather than one that does not at all seem to say what James says that it says. 1518 God knew all of his works from the beginning of the world, but man did not. Man knew the prophecy program, 321, but he did not know the mystery program, Romans 16 verse 25. James' point is that this mystery program may be new to his audience, but God knew what he would do all along. By the way, modern translations take God out of this verse. Therefore, they say that man knew about the mystery program all along, making God out to be a liar in Romans 16 verse 25. 1519 James gives the sentence, which means that he is now the leader of the little flock. But, Jesus made Peter the leader, in Matthew 16 verses 18 to 19, by giving him the keys of the kingdom. So, what happened to Peter's power to forgive or retain sins, Matthew 16 verse 19? It has gone away, due to the new, mystery dispensation that the Lord Jesus Christ started with the Apostle Paul. 15, 20-21 James is not offering a compromise between law and grace by trying to put the Gentiles under part of the law. Rather, these verses tell you the reason he wants the Gentiles to obey certain laws. The reason is that he recognizes that every city has Jewish religious leaders who preach the law in their synagogues every day. So as not to offend the Jews going to the synagogues, he asks that the Gentile believers, under grace, choose to give up some of their liberty so that followers of the Jewish religion will not be offended by them and will believe the gospel of grace. Paul says the same thing in his epistles. For example, James says to abstain from pollutions of idols. Paul says that an idol is nothing in the world. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. I Corinthians 8 colon 4, 7, 13. Therefore, while believers today are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14, James asks the Gentile believers to put themselves under certain laws voluntarily so that people may be saved and those saved under the gospel of the kingdom will not stumble. This is all part of the mystery doctrine to be made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 22. 1522 The issue of what saved Gentiles in the mystery program should be doing in light of saved Jews in the prophecy program has now been settled in Jerusalem. Since some from Jerusalem taught contrary doctrine in Antioch, the Jerusalem saints now send Judas and Silas to Antioch so that the Antiochians know that the bad doctrine taught them by people in Jerusalem is not what they should be following. 1523, the phrase, which are of the Gentiles, shows that the believers of the body of Christ are different from the believers of Israel's program. 1524, the phrase, subverting your souls, shows that the brethren in Jerusalem recognized the change in dispensations. The Jerusalem saints needed to be circumcised, because God said that the uncircumcised man-child's soul shall be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant, Genesis 17 verse 14. But, God told the body of Christ that circumcision does not avail anything, Galatians 6 verse 15. Therefore, those, requiring circumcision, were subverting your souls, because the Gentile saints in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia did not need to be circumcised because they were saved under the mystery program, where they are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. 15, 25-26 The Jerusalem saints also recognized Barnabas and Paul as ministers of the grace of God to the Gentiles. 
In giving his account of the meeting that just happened in Jerusalem, Paul mentions the result was the agreement that Paul and Barnabas would preach the mystery program to unbelievers, while the twelve apostles would limit their ministry to edifying those already saved under the kingdom, Galatians 2 verse 9. Thus, the twelve apostles recognized God's change in program and abandoned the so-called Great Commission, Matthew 28 verses 19-20. 1527 It was so important for the body of Christ to understand that they did not need to keep the law, that the little flock sent both written instructions and verbal instructions that they should not be required to be circumcised and to keep the law. 15,28-29 The Jerusalem saints have already made it clear that the Gentiles do not need to keep the law. 1524 Therefore, these things for them to keep are only necessary so that those saved under the kingdom program do not lose faith, and so that Jews going to synagogues in their towns are not offended by the gospel of grace. Also, note that the little flock's instructions came from the Holy Ghost, which shows, much to the chagrin of today's liberal scholars, that James' sentence, 1519, was really God's instructions on the matter, and not just the opinion of man. 1532 Judas and Silas were prophets, which is another proof that there were prophets during this time period, because the word of God had not been completed yet. They are part of the prophets to which Peter referred when he said that all the prophets witness to the gospel of grace being the gospel for today, 10, 42-43. It is also these prophets to which Paul referred when he said that the mystery now is made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets, Romans 16 verses 25 to 26. These scriptures would be Paul's epistles. They are scriptures of the prophets because it was the prophets who determined which ones of Paul's epistles were thus saith the Lord, and thus official scripture. Therefore, you should not automatically think of Isaiah through Malachi when scripture uses the word prophet. 15,33-34 Judas went back to Jerusalem, but Silas stayed in Antioch. This is important to note because Paul's second apostolic journey will soon begin, and Silas will be his partner now, instead of Barnabas, 1540. But, if you have a modern version, you do not have that detail, because 1534 is omitted from the modern versions, which means that 1540 does not make sense. 1536 God's will is for all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, Acts 13 to 14 records Paul and Barnabas' journey to various cities, preaching the gospel of grace. Now, Paul wants to check up on the believers in those cities, to make sure they are fulfilling the second part of God's will for them, to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 15, 37-41, Satan rears his ugly head, creating a sharp contention between Paul and Barnabas over John Mark. Mark went with them on their first apostolic journey, but he quit before they finished, 1313. Because of this, Paul does not want Mark going with them but Barnabas does want Mark going with them. The result is a split between Paul and Barnabas. However, Satan's splitting up of the pair works for God's glory. Paul still goes on his trip, but he goes with Silas. Barnabas goes on a trip of his own with John Mark. Therefore, instead of one team going out, two teams go out. John Mark must have stuck with Barnabas this time because, toward the end of his life, Paul says that Mark is profitable to me for the ministry, 2 Timothy 4 verse 11. Thus, Satan's plan is thwarted. This is the opposite result of a similar attack of Satan at the beginning of the kingdom program. Then, Satan worked a strife between Abram and Lot, the result of which was a split, Genesis 13 verses 7 to 8. Lot went to Sodom and Gomorrah which was destroyed because of their homosexuality. Satan, therefore, is probably hoping for a similar result with Paul and Barnabas split, but the Holy Spirit has a different plan. This also shows the greater power that God has on earth in the dispensation of grace, because the Holy Spirit indwells believers now. 16 Paul's second apostolic journey continues. People are saved in Philippi, and Paul gets to teach them the doctrine of suffering, as Paul is beaten and thrown in jail. 16, 1-3, the main issue in Acts 15 was over circumcision. 
Men from Jerusalem were teaching in Antioch that except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. 15, colon 1. Paul disputed greatly with them, 15, colon 2, since Paul says in Galatians 6 verse 15 that in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Paul went to Jerusalem to make sure the kingdom saints understand that the mystery saints do not have to be circumcised to be saved. Does it seem strange, then, that the first recorded event by Paul in his next apostolic journey is that he circumcises Timothy? Not at all. All things are lawful. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 To the believer in this dispensation, because we are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. Therefore, Paul can do whatever he wants to do. What he wants to do is have men saved. Though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I Corinthians 9, 19-20, 22. Paul uses his liberty in Christ to gain souls for Christ. With this background, let us look at the situation in 16, 1-3. Timothy had a Jewish mother and a Gentile father. All the Jews in those quarters knew that Timothy's father was a Greek. Therefore, if Timothy was to preach the gospel of grace to the Jews, the Jewish religious leaders would probably render Timothy's preaching null and void because they would tell the common Jews not to listen to Timothy since he had never been circumcised. Therefore, Although circumcision availeth nothing, Paul uses his liberty and grace to circumcise Timothy so that he might eliminate the Jews' argument against Timothy so that he might gain the Jews. This is important for us to understand because Paul is our apostle, Romans 11 verse 13, and he says that Christ did not send him to baptize, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Therefore, we should not be water baptizing people today. Yet, Christianity will turn to passages, like 1615, where Paul baptized someone, to prove that we should be baptized today. Well, if that is true, then we also need to circumcise new male converts today. However, when we understand that Paul circumcised Timothy only to be able to reach the Jews, then we also understand why Paul baptized some new converts, even though Christ did not send him to baptize. 16, 4-5 Paul is going through the Gentile churches that he visited on his first, apostolic journey to deliver to them the request from the little flock of kingdom saints to the Gentiles saved by grace to abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood, 1520, so as not to offend those attending Jewish synagogues, 1521. 16, 5 tells us that this was a success. The churches increased in number daily, since they were not offending the law-keeping Jews, because they were obeying the parts of the law of which disobedience was most offensive to the Jews. 16, 6 The book of Galatians had probably been written before this time. The main focus of the letter is how the Galatians were so soon removed from the gospel of grace to the Jewish traditions, Galatians 1 verse 6. This shows how the Gentile churches had already been tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4 verse 14, which is why Paul's second apostolic journey, to re-establish the Gentiles in mystery doctrine and confirm the part of the law they should follow so as not to offend the Jews, was so essential. It also makes me wonder if the reason John Mark left Paul and Barnabas on their first apostolic journey and returned to Jerusalem, 1313, was because he was being tossed to and fro by bad doctrine, too, which would explain why Paul would not take him on his second apostolic journey. 16, 6-7 Paul, Timothy, and Silas were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, and the Spirit also kept them from going into Bithynia. The reason is that there are people in Philippi who need to hear the gospel and believe. A church was established there, and, after the book of Acts was over, the epistle to the Philippians was written, which we have today in God's word. Meanwhile, although Paul did eventually go to Asia with the gospel, the believers there ended up turning away from him later on, 2 Timothy 1 verse 15. 
Therefore, it was more needful that Paul go to Philippi. Today, Christians like to pray for God's guidance about taking a job, marrying a spouse, or moving to a different location. They will use verses, like 16,6-7, to support this, since the Holy Ghost forbade Paul from going to Asia and the Holy Spirit did not allow him to go to Bithynia. However, there are a few problems with trying to apply this today. First, we have God's completed word. Therefore, God speaks through his word when he also spoke outside of his word before it was completed. Second, Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, and was commissioned by God to go to all unbelievers before he died, 9:15. No one else has ever received such a commission. Granted, we are ambassadors of Christ today, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, but our location does not matter to God. This is seen in the fact that, even before the word of God was completed, there was no problem with Apollos going against the will of Paul. See 1 Corinthians 16 verse 12, even though Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. 16 colon 8-10 2 Corinthians 2 verses 12 to 13 says that Paul had a door opened unto him of the Lord to preach Christ's gospel in Troas, but he left for Macedonia because he did not find Titus in Troas. The Acts account says that Paul received a vision, whereby the Lord called them to go to Macedonia. Since God's word is true, John 17 verse 17, both of these. Accounts must be true. Since the Lord opened a door in Troas, and the Lord also gave a vision to go to Macedonia, this shows that the Lord was leaving it up to Paul to decide what he wanted to do. This shows that, for the mature Christian, the choice is not between good or bad, but between good and better. Paul had a good opportunity in Troas to preach the gospel, but he had a better one in Macedonia. Therefore, he made the decision to go to Macedonia. He could have made the decision to stay in Troas, and that would have been okay, too, since God always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and mocketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14. Therefore, we should not agonize over what would the Lord have me to do. If you walk in the Spirit, God will work through you, regardless of the circumstance you decide to put yourself in. God in your circumstance is what is important, not the circumstance itself. 16.10 When referring to Paul's journeys, Luke has used the term they, 16.7. Now, Luke switches to we, showing that, once they got to Troas, Luke joined Paul, Silas, and Timothy on their journey. 16,12-13 Philippi, is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. Since it is the chief city and Paul baptizes Lydia after she is saved, there probably was a Jewish synagogue in Philippi. However, Paul breaks custom and goes to a river outside the city, where some women had gathered for prayer. Apparently, the vision he had must have told him to go to the river instead. It appears that this was not a place where the saints gathered, because 1616 tells us that a woman with a spirit of divination was there. Therefore, this may have been a satanic place of prayer. Thus, while the human good side of man, Romans 2, was seen in the Jewish synagogues, the human evil side of man, Romans 1, is seen here by the river outside of Philippi. Both need Christ as their Savior, Romans 3. 1615 Paul baptized Lydia, which tells us that she must have had business with the Jews. She probably sold her purple, 1614, to the Jews. If so, she was familiar with the Jewish religion, and she was probably frustrated with the hypocrisy of it all. Yet, she worshipped God, 1614. This may be why Paul received the vision to come to Macedonia. To preach the gospel, much like Peter received the vision, in Acts 10, to preach to Cornelius. Since Lydia's business probably brought her into the synagogue, Paul baptized her so as not to offend members of the little flock, just like he circumcised Timothy earlier in the chapter so as not to offend the Jews. 16,16-18 The spirit of divination, although being one of Satan's angels, proclaimed the truth that these men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew unto us the way of salvation, 1617. Why would Satan want to call attention to the way of salvation? 
What Satan is doing is he is trying to get people to listen to the devil inside this woman, rather than to Paul. This would not be hard to do, since the damsel is well known, 1616. Then, having convinced people to listen to the devil, the spirit of divination would give false and blasphemous doctrine so that people would listen to the devil, rather than to Paul. Thus, this is Satan's way of getting people to ignore God's apostle to the Gentiles. Knowing this, Paul commands the devil to come out of the damsel. The same thing goes on today. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. These doctrines of devils come from Satan's ministers, who have transformed themselves into ministers of righteousness, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15. These ministers are in the pulpits of most Christian churches today. They speak God's word, but they corrupt the word of God, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17. It is no coincidence, then, that the woman, in 1616, had a spirit of divination, while most Christian pastors have a master's degree or doctorate in divinity. 1619 Paul and Silas are persecuted because, with the devil being cast out of the woman, her master's hope of monetary gain has been dashed. This is the same reason the Jewish religious leaders persecuted Jesus, the Twelve Apostles, and Paul. Truth is cast out in favor of money, which is why 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 says that the love of money is the root of all evil, and that it causes people to err from the faith. 16 20-21 Just like Jesus was falsely accused, Paul and Silas are falsely accused. They did not teach the Philippians to disobey Roman law. They merely cast a devil out of a woman. Since they did not do anything unlawful, her masters have to bring Paul and Silas in on a trumped-up charge. Her masters say that Paul and Silas had taught the Romans to obey Jewish customs, when they had actually taught people not to follow Jewish customs, but to believe the mystery gospel. The same thing happens today for those following the mystery doctrine found only in Paul's epistles. Unbelievers think we are teaching people to follow Christian traditions, when we are actually teaching people to abandon Christian traditions and believe God's word instead. Christians do not like us because we teach against their traditions, and unbelievers do not like us because we teach God's word. Therefore, all are against us, which is why Paul says that, if what we believe is false, we are of all men most miserable, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19. However, because what we believe is true we can rejoice evermore, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16, even though no one likes us. 16 22 22-24 The magistrates prove to be unjust judges, as they have Paul and Silas beaten with only an accusation against them. There is no proof that Paul and Silas did anything unlawful, and Paul and Silas have not been given a chance to respond to the accusation. They are beaten with many stripes, cast into the worst part of the prison, which is the inner prison, and their feet are fastened into stocks. They are treated like murderers even though they have done nothing wrong. 1625 Paul and Silas had been beaten with many stripes, 1623, and thrown into the worst part of the prison, 1624, although they had done nothing wrong. Yet, they sang praises unto God. That is what I call a true worship service. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16, we are commanded to rejoice evermore. Joy comes from the inward man, while happiness is dependent upon happenings. Paul and Silas demonstrate that it is possible to have joy, regardless of the circumstance you are in. 1626 The Great Earthquake Shook the Foundations of the Prison However, God must have caused the doors to be opened and the bands to be loosed apart from the earthquake. After all, the whole building would have probably caved in before the bands loosed as a result of the earthquake. Therefore, this event cannot be explained by an act of Mother Nature, as seen by the reactions of the prisoners and the jailer. 16 28 Why did the guilty prisoners stay in prison, even though all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed? Note that 1625 says that the prisoners heard them singing praises unto God. Paul must have told the prisoners to stay put, and they did so. This shows the power of rejoicing in a dire and unfair situation. 
These prisoners stuck around so that they might have what Paul and Silas have, the indwelling Holy Spirit, that would cause them to rejoice in prison, even though sticking around would probably cost these prisoners their freedom. The reason Paul told the prisoners to stay put is because the jailer would have killed himself otherwise and would have gone to hell. Instead, he ends up asking the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? 1630, and receives the gift of eternal life. Christians usually ask for God to take suffering away, but joy in suffering is what causes unbelievers to believe the gospel. After all, a joyful Christian is no big deal to the world when he has money in the bank and life is good. However, when he is suffering and he is more joyful than unbelievers, who are in a better situation, the unbelievers will want to know a reason of the hope that is in the believer, 1 Peter 3 verse 15. Therefore, it is through afflictions that the power of Christ rests upon us, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, and not through material prosperity. 16.29-30 Having been through earthquakes myself, I know that people naturally run out of a building as fast as they can. Prisoners would be doubly fast, since they would want to be free. This shows that the power of Christ is like no other, such that the jailer trembles and falls down when faced with this power. He did not tremble over the earthquake and the opening of the jail, but he trembled at the fact that Paul and Silas kept all of the prisoners there. Now, the jailer did not hear Paul and Silas singing, because he was asleep, 1627. Yet, he goes right up to them, falls down before them, and asks them how he can be saved. This shows that he recognized that God had sprung them out of jail. If God has that kind of power, then he is in trouble with God. Therefore, he asks for salvation from God's wrath. 16.31-32 The gospel of grace is just to believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins. Water baptism is no longer required for salvation. Christians will quote 1631 to say it is the gospel, but it is not. It only says to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no detail there. James 2 verse 19 says that the devils believe there is a God, and they tremble. Yet, they are not saved. You ask a fundamental Christian what the gospel is, and most of them will say to believe in Jesus or trust Jesus. However, that does not save you. 1632 says that they spake unto him the word of the Lord. That is when they shared the gospel with him. They showed him that he is guilty before the Lord, because he has sinned, Romans 3 verse 23. They then shared that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead as the payment for his sins. If they believe that, then they are saved, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Christians also get confused over Paul's mention of thy house, as if Paul is saying that the man's decision counted for his whole household. However, there is no confusion here, because 1632 says that Paul also spoke the word of the Lord to everyone in the guy's house. If the jailer made the decision for his whole house, there would be no need to share the gospel with everyone else. The fact that Paul did share the gospel with everyone in the house shows that each person has to make his own individual decision to trust the blood of Jesus Christ for salvation. Therefore, in 1631, Paul is just saying that the offer of salvation is extended to the jailer's whole house, 1632. 1633 water baptism was required for salvation in Israel's program, 238 and Mark 16 verse 16. It is not required today. Paul said that Christ sent him to preach the gospel, not to baptize, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Yet, he still baptized in some cases so as not to offend those saved in Israel's program. Most of fundamental Christianity says that water. Baptism is an outward manifestation of an inward work of grace, but this idea is not found in scripture anywhere. Christianity has made water baptism an initiation ceremony so that the local church can have control over you. Satan has gotten so many to do this so as to mask the true baptism by the Holy Spirit into Christ's death, Romans 6 verses 3 to 4 and 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, because, if you learned that, you would know how to walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 16. But, if you are water baptized instead, then you focus on the flesh so that you cannot serve Christ. 
That is why Satan has made water baptism such a big deal in Christianity. Again, just because Paul baptized someone does not mean we should do that today. Paul also circumcised Timothy 16 colon 3, but you do not see fundamental Christianity sharpening their knives to circumcise people. Note how Colossians 2 verses 11 to 12 says that we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and part of that is that we are buried with him in baptism. So, if the circumcision is spiritual, the baptism must be spiritual, too, especially since God says there is only one baptism today, Ephesians 4 verse 5. Therefore, God only recognizes your baptism by the Holy Spirit into Christ's death. Also, if this baptism were water, it would not say that we are buried in baptism. Rather, it would say that we are dunked or sprinkled in baptism. This shows how Satan has gotten Christianity to twist God's word so that you do not realize your completeness in Christ, Colossians 2 verse 10. Thus, upon believing, the new convert is initiated by water baptism into the flesh-oriented system of religion known as Christianity so that he does not believe God and his word. 1634 note that all of his house believed the gospel, as well. Therefore, they are all saved, not because he believed, but because each individual member of his house believed. 1635 After the great earthquake, the open doors, the loose chains, and the prisoners staying put, the magistrates are probably scared of Paul and his group now. Therefore, they try to get rid of them quietly. 1637 From the account of 16, 19-23, it appears that Paul never got to share the gospel with the magistrates. If the magistrates have to come themselves and fetch us out, Paul would have a chance to share the gospel with them. This would be a perfect opportunity to do so, given the sign that God has already performed of the earthquake, open doors, loose chains, and the prisoners staying put. This is probably why Paul makes this demand. The point is that Paul probably objected to leaving quietly, not because he wanted to embarrass the magistrates, but because he was thinking of God's twofold will for all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Therefore, we can deduce that his motivation for calling the magistrates was to share the gospel with them. 1638 The magistrates had to come to Paul, because they could have gotten in trouble for breaking the Roman law by beating Paul without a cause. 16, 39-40 Paul pays no attention to the request of the magistrates. He does leave the prison, having shared the gospel with them, but he does not immediately depart out of the city. Instead, he goes to the house of Lydia, where the believers met so that Paul could work on the second part of God's will, which is for all men to come unto the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. This is seen in Paul's comforting the brethren, Paul was the one beaten, arrested, and told to get out of the city, yet Paul is comforting the brethren. Shouldn't it be the other way around? No, because if the brethren continue to follow the mystery program, they will have tribulations in that city, and so they need God's comfort in order to continue to walk in the Spirit. As such, Paul fulfilled 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 to 4, the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. God comforted Paul in the prison, such that he sang praises to the Lord, Acts 16 verse 25. Now, Paul can comfort the new believers in Philippi that God will do the same for them when they are in trouble.